Hi everybody and welcome to Analyzing Software Using Deep Learning. This is a course at University of Stuttgart in summer 2020. In the second module of the course, we will look at recurrent neural networks or short RNNs and how to use them for analyzing software. So this um, module will have three parts where the first focuses on recurrent neural networks and what they actually are. Um, this first part is not really specific to analyzing software, but basically gives a background on the machine learning side um, that we need to understand the rest of it. And then the second and the third part will show concrete applications of these recurrent neural networks. One of them is going to be about code completion. So how to complete code that uh, is missing some, uh, some parts. And then the third um, part of this module will be about repairing a specific kind of error, namely syntax errors and how to use recurrent neural networks for that. In the previous module, we introduced some of the basics of neural networks and basically reasoned about them at the level of individual neurons. The first thing we will do today and also in the rest of this course is to abstract away from individual neurons and to instead look at layers of neurons. So what we'll do here is to go from, from neurons to layers. So to, have, to see how this works, um, let's first have a look um, one more time at a neural network by looking at individual neurons. For example, let's take a network that looks like this. So we have an input layer with three neurons, then a hidden layer with two neurons, and then an output layer with three neurons, and everything is connected to everything um, like this. Now, what... Um, the computation that is done at every individual neuron is the following. So the output of every neuron is some function. And this could be any of these activation functions, for example, that we have seen. And then for every neuron, we take the weight um, of this, um, of the incoming connection times the input that comes in plus some bias. And in this case, um, these x and f and b values are all scalars. For example, they could just be um, real numbers. And the w here is this vector of, um, of weights. So this is a vector. For example, this could be a vector of n real numbers if there are n input neurons uh, or in inputs that come into a neuron. Now, instead of this look at individual neurons, we will now abstract them into layers of neurons that I will represent using these uh, little rectangles. And then the same network that we just looked at will look like this, where we basically have these three layers, an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. And now we can express our computation also in terms of, of layers, where we say that for each layer, the following is computed as the output. So the output is again some function f, which may be an activation function, for example. But now we have capital W times x plus b. And to reflect the fact that we do not talk about individual neurons anymore, but about layers, um, these values x and f and b are now all vectors. For example, vectors in, um, in r to the power of n. And w, capital letter w, is now a matrix, which is our matrix of weights. And this could, for example, be in r to the power of m times n where n is the dimension of, um, of input connections that come into a layer and n is the number of neurons that we have in the layer. Based on this notion of layers, we can now have a look at recurrent neural networks, which will be the focus of this module. So what we have seen so far are feed-forward networks and feed-forward networks are not recurrent networks. 
And what we want to look at mostly in this uh, module today are recurrent networks. So what's the main difference between them? Um, a feed forward network basically looks like this. We have some input layer, we have some hidden layer, maybe some more hidden layers in between, and then eventually some output layer. Let's call this input layer X, the hidden layer H, and the output layer Y. And let's also give these matrices some names that control how the inputs or how the outputs of one layer are transformed to give us the outputs of the next layer. Um, and let's call these matrices uh, U and, and V. So X and H and Y here correspond to the input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. And U and W uh, U and V and W, which we'll introduce in a second, correspond uh, to these weight matrices that control how the layers actually work. Now, the feedforward network on the left um, just processes one input at a time. And in contrast to this, a recurrent network looks as follows. So it also has an input layer. It also has a hidden layer, maybe more of them and then eventually has an output layer. And again, we call them X, H, and Y. And also the matrices that control what happens between these layers um, is basically the same, again, U and V. But what's new now is that we also have a connection from the hidden layer to the next time step of this same hidden layer. And I'll use this little rectangle here as a symbol to denote that this is a connection that goes over time and we'll see in a second what this over time really means. And this connection over time is controlled by yet another weight matrix W, which tells us how the value of H at some time step T depends on the values of this um, value of this layer H at the previous time step T minus one. So just to give my errors a little bit more meaning here. So if we, um, if I use this normal error, then this is just a normal function. And if I use this arrow that has this little black rectangle on top, then this is a function that also has a delay of a single time step. Why do we care about this delay here? Well, it's important for uh, two reasons. One of them is that it is very useful for representing sequences of inputs and also sequences of, of outputs. And the basic idea here is that every um, element of such a sequence is represented as one time step. And then by going through time, we can basically process the entire sequence. And the second reason why this is useful is that um, this hidden layer that takes some information from the past, in a sense, is able to store some information about previous inputs. So if you are given a sequence of, of elements, then what this um, hidden layer essentially does is to store some information about the past elements that we have already seen so that we can use all of this information to make, um, well, to determine the output of the hidden layer. Let's make all of this a little bit more concrete by looking at a concrete example. And this example will be to predict the next word in a sentence.
So as a um, concrete sentence, let's say we have a sentence that starts with ASDL. The name of this course is the best. And then the missing word comes. And as you may be able to guess, the word that we would like to see here, uh, here is course. And now let's have a look at how we could um, get this prediction from a feed forward network and from a recurrent network. So for a feed forward network, what we could do is the following. We could basically feed one word at a time into the network. And then it's supposed to predict the next word for us. So for example, we would start with ASDL and hope that the network is able to predict is for us. And then we do this for all following words. And at the end, we hopefully query it for best and it hopefully gives us the answer course. Now this is really hard for the model um, because it basically sees only one word at a time. So given the word best, it is supposed to answer course, but it doesn't really know the rest of the sentence. So it's 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 very hard to, to be right here. Uh, in contrast, a recurrent network will see all the words that have already happened um, in the past, so basically the beginning of the sentence, and we'll use this to predict the rest of the sentence. So at time step one, we will provide the first word to this model. So this looks very similar to what we um, do for the feed forward network. And now the difference is that at Later time steps, we still have the information from the words that we have seen at the beginning because of this recurrent layer um, that is the important feature of a recurrent uh, network. And that means when we later at time step four see the query that um, starts um, yeah, the, the query given the word best, it now sees the information from, from the past and is hopefully able to um, predict course simply because in this hidden layer here, we are storing information about the beginning of the sentence. So this recurrent connection remembers the beginning of the sentence. So now what does it really mean to remember something? Um, let's um, have a deeper look at what this really means by unfolding the computational graph, which means by basically looking at what happens um, in the model during these different time steps. So by unfolding the computational graph, I essentially mean that we'll look at individual time steps instead of just having this recurrent little arrow that doesn't really show us what's going on under the hood. So the not yet unfolded version of this model, and now I'm just um, writing it um, yeah, slightly differently, looks like this. We have this input layer, the hidden layer, and the output layer. And they are connected just as before with the only difference now that I've basically turned it on the side. And we have these matrices here that control how these different layers are connected with each other. And now the unfolding happens. Where we look at individual time steps, so we have this notion of 
the past, which I just abbreviate with dot dot dot, the past gives us something, we'll see what this is in a second. And then for every time step, we have um, some input, some hidden layer and some output. So here, this is time step t minus one. So this is the input x of t minus one, which is given to the hidden layer at t minus one, which will then produce the output y at t minus one. And then at the next time step, this output of h of t minus one is taken as the next input to the hidden layer. So the hidden layer at time step t. And in addition, of course, it gets the next input. So this will be the input at time step t and then produces an output at time step t. And this goes on and on and on for different time steps, basically until the end of our input sequence. So until this um, reaches the end of the sequence. Now let's get back to our concrete example. So for example, at t minus one, the input might be is, and the model may be able to predict that the output should be the. Then we take this output that was predicted by the model and feed it into um, the next time step. And now what the model knows is that the is the next input, but it also knows something about the past because of this connection from h of t minus one. And combining these two pieces of information, it may be able to predict best. And then we basically do the same. We take this predicted output best and feed it into the model again, which also takes all the information from the past through um, the connection from h of t. And then hopefully is able to predict cause um, as, the, as the missing word. So let's also have a look at how this works mathematically. So basically the output of h at some time t is a function of the state of h at t minus one and of the input x at time step t. And then the output of the whole model at a time step t, so y of t is a function of h of t, which um, yeah, is defined just above. To make this more concrete, let's have a look at how this could be typically um, implemented. So for example, this could be implemented as follows, that h of t is the hyperbolic tangent 10h of um, the state of h of t minus one multiplied by this um, weight matrix w that we also see on the folded um, image on the left, plus the input that we get from x at time step t multiplied with the other weight matrix that um, we also see on the left, namely u, plus some bias. The hyperbolic tangent is just yet another activation function. So let me just um, give you an idea of how this looks like. Um, so it basically looks similar to the sigmoid function that we've seen earlier, just that this is now shifted a little towards uh, the negative numbers. And looks something like this. So it comes in from here, then goes through zero, zero, and then goes up here. So it again has this S-like shape, but um, can have a negative value as well as a positive value. To give you a concrete example of how this um, function of uh, y of t could look like, so one option that people might use if they want to predict words out of a given vocabulary, for example, um, to predict the next word in a sentence, would look as follows. So we would say y of t is the result of the softmax function and we'll see in a minute what this really means, um, of the value of h of t multiplied with the weight matrix v plus some other 
um, bias, which we here call C, just to disambiguate it from the bias um, that we use for the hidden layer. So let's now have a look at what this softmax function is and why we want to use it here to um, yeah, compute the output of y of t. So what softmax does is to essentially uh, give us a vector that we can interpret as a probability distribution. So it takes a vector of k numbers that are all um, real, uh, real valued numbers and then it squashes them um, such that they sum up to one and such that each of these values is in the range uh, between zero and one. So essentially this looks like a probability distribution and if we interpret this uh, interpret the output of a softmax function as a probability distribution, we can for example predict how likely each of the different words that might come next are according to the model. So let's have a look at how this is um, defined. So in order to compute the softmax function, um, this formula here is computed. So we take all the elements um, in our vector y and then for each of them um, compute e to the power of y um, divided by the, the sum of all these um, e to the power of y values. So for example, if we um, have this value given, which does not look like a um, uh, probability distribution at all, then what softmax will do for us is to turn it into this vector, which basically has the same, um, gives the same importance to each of these values. So um, the value four here in the middle um, corresponds to this one and it still is the largest value. But this vector that we get from softmax now looks like a probability distribution. So the sum of all the values is one and each of the values is between zero and one. So to double check if this idea was clear, um, let's have a little quiz where you're basically given um, a few vectors and the question is which of these vectors could be the output of the softmax function. So I invite you here to pause the video um, in order to think independently about um, these four vectors. And once you think you know which of those um, could be the outcome of the softmax function, then um, resume the video. So let me show you the solution. So the first one is clearly not a possible output of the softmax function because it's all zeros. So it does not look like a probability distribution simply because its values do not sum up to one. The second one looks fine. All the values are in the zero to one range and the sum of all these values is, is one. Um, the same for the third one, which is a kind of strange probability distribution because it basically gives all the probability to um, the second element, but it is one, so that's fine. And the third one again um, looks, uh, sorry, the fourth one looks fine at first because all the values are between zero and one, but their sum is not equal to one and therefore this is not a legal probability distribution and hence not a possible outcome of the softmax function. So you now have an idea what these RNNs, these recurrent neural networks are. Um, before we look into applications for analyzing software, um, let's have a look at some applications in other domains. Um, where RNNs are useful. So essentially you can use them for any task where the input and maybe also the output is a sequence of something. So just to give you a few examples, so one concrete application um, where this could be useful is um, for unsegmented connected handwriting recognition, where you basically have handwriting that is not yet split into individual characters and the model simply gets a sequence of these pixels that uh, represent a different chunks of your uh, handwriting and then is supposed to predict the actual um, uh, characters or maybe digits. Another example is um, machine translation of natural languages where we have sequences of words in one language given as the input and then would like the model to predict a sequence of words in some other language, for example, to translate from English to German. Yet another example is um, video classification by frames, where the sequence is a sequence of frames that um, um, yeah, build up the, the video. And then we want to classify this video, for example, to say whether this is about cats and dogs or about something else. Yet another example is speech recognition, because speech naturally is a sequence. It's just a sequence of, um, of audio that comes in. 
And um, this sequence can also be um, fed into an RNN in order to recognize what a person is actually saying. And as a final example, um, what you can also do with RNNs is to do a sentiment analysis of Twitter messages where you want to find out whether the person writing a message is angry or happy or, or whatever. Um, and here the sequence would be a sequence of words or maybe a sequence of characters that make up um, this Twitter message. So, and this already brings us to the end of this first part of this module on using recurrent networks for analyzing software. So you now hopefully know, um, or at least have an idea of what a recurrent neural network is. And in the second and third part, we can now see how to use these recurrent neural networks for um, two applications in software, namely um, code completion and automated program repair. Thanks for listening and see you next time.